Thank you. Um, and we are very pleased to have so many people here today and very excited um, to introduce you to the students in Massachusetts who have been working hard for the past three years to advocate for OER across Massachusetts. And um, I'm sure you guys will learn a lot from them and Welcome, and if you could go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, just type your name and where you're from. Um, we'd love to see who is um, with us today. All right, so let's get started. The agenda for today will be introductions, and then we'll have the student panel we'll, where we'll address several issues around open education and then talk a little bit about some of the upcoming events that we have in the spring as part of CCCOER and Open Ed Week. All right, so let's get started with the introductions. So we have our student panelists here and um, I'd like each of the student panelists to introduce themselves and also talk about the highest amount of money you've ever spent on a textbook in one semester or how much money you've saved over a semester by using OER. And let's get started with Nikki. Thank you, Sue. Hi, everybody. My name is Nikki. Um, I'm the vice chair of the Student Advisory Council, and I'm also the head of our um, subcommittee. And I'm from Bunker Hill Community College. Uh, my majors are biology and government. And to answer Sue's question, um, I've spent about like the most money I've spent on books is about $600 for one semester. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a student OER ambassador with Middlesex Community College, and I'm also the head of the public information OER subcommittee. I've saved a significant amount. Most biology textbooks are between $100 and $150 and over my winter intercession course that was completely OER. So I was able to save $100 that I was able to use on a plane ticket to see my partner. Ooh, that's great, Andrew. And Yorgo? Hi, everybody. My name is Yorgo. I'm the chair of the Student Advisory Council and also a community college segmental advisor to the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education. I've been with the statewide OER Advisory Council since March 2020. And I'm pretty honored to be serving on this council and helping implement OER on a wider scale in, here in Massachusetts. I am majoring in electrical engineering, so you can imagine that my books are quite expensive. And I've spent about six to $700 per semester. Um, I could say the least. <laughs> and yeah, it's good to be here. All right, thank you, Yorgo and Cody. Hi, everybody. My name is Cody Nathanson. I am a student at Mount Wachusett Community College. I am the OER ambassador, and I am a co-chair uh, co of the social media subcommittee. And I, un unlike the rest of my uh, student panelists, I've been fortunate enough that I haven't had to pay for my own books because I came from the uh, adult education program. So adult education program, but the classes, if I were to pay for them, the biggest book I had to spend money on would have been my biology book, which would have ran me $250. I don't know about you guys. I, I think it could be hard to justify uh, spending that much money on a book. And the online version was a much cheaper 45. And I'm happy to be here and get to talk to everybody. Thank you, Cody. All right. And my name is Sue Tajan, and I am the co-president of the CCC OER um, panel, um, executive council, along with Lisa Young from Scottsdale Community College. I'm also the coordinator of instructional technology at Northern Essex Community College and serve as co-chair of the um, Massachusetts OER Advisory Council. And I'd like to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Robert Awkward and Bob, Robert, go ahead, <laughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, glad to be here today. And um, for those of you, because there are a lot of folks on here, 
we know, but for those of you who are not, yes, my last name really is awkward. And no, I'm not, at least I try not. Um, <laughs> and I'm just delighted to be here with our student leaders to uh, both share and learn from them. I'm the uh, Assistant Commissioner for Academic Effectiveness at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. And I get the pleasure in that role to work with uh, these, fa these fabulous students here and with Sue and others uh, as the statewide OER coordinator in Massachusetts for our public higher education uh, system. So um, I'm just, 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 just a delight to, to be here and to hear their, hear their lived experiences and what they've learned. And more importantly, the role they played in advocacy in our state to help push this, this uh, movement forward. So looking forward to the session ahead. Thank you, Bob. Just a little bit about CCCOER for those who are not familiar with it. CCCOER is the Community College Consortium for Open Education. Um, they are part of, a, um, of the Open Education Global, and their mission is to expand awareness and access to high quality OER and support faculty development, foster regional and OER leadership, and most importantly, improve student equity and success. And Northern Essex became a member of CCC OER about five years ago when we started an open ed initiative. And I will say that it was the best um, move that we made in the greatest community that we became involved in. And we have really networked and learned so much from members from all over the country which leads me to the next slide. And this is our membership in 2021. We have 90 members in 34 states from, as you can see, dispersed all through the country. And we also have 16 system-wide memberships. So if you're interested in CCC OER, if you're not a member, um, take a look at the website and you can read all the wonderful benefits of becoming a member of CCC OER. All right, and so now I'm gonna turn it over to Bob and he's gonna give you a little history about OER in Massachusetts. Thank you, Sue. Uh, well, as I said, I, I, it's so great for me to, to be here with students because our students have both been the, are both the beneficiaries of this work that we're doing in open educational resources and have been the progenitors of this work uh, in, in, to, in large part. And I'm saying that because the Student Advisory Council resolution um, that uh, Yorgo, who's currently the, the president of, it, that's really what prompted the Board of Higher Education to get actively engaged in this work. The Student Advisory Council came, made a presentation to the board, um, and had indicated by a vote of 19 to zero that basically called the board out and said, you guys need to get on board with this, with this movement. You need to really take leadership because this is an issue of huge concern for students and would be of huge benefit. And that was the spring of 2018. By the fall, um, I working with the deputy commissioner for academic affairs and student success, Patricia Marshall, of create, we put together a, a working group. Uh, the commissioner asked a group of people to serve on it. And uh, among those people who served on that working group included Sue Tashton from Northern Essex, who was the co-chair of the working group and is also co-chair of the advisory council, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And Marilyn Billings, who I know was on this call and um, from UMass Amherst, who's also co-chair of the working group and now the advisory council. So that working group worked feverishly to put together a final report and it included 10 recommendations for change to, to, to expand this effort across our public higher education system. The report was accepted by the Academic Affairs Committee of the board in October and the Board of Higher Education, both accepted the report unanimously and urged us to move forward aggressively in this space. Um, next slide, please. 
Oh, I have it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, these were the final recommendations in that report uh, that were, as you can see, set up in a time horizon, short-term, mid-term, long-term. And the green items on here are ones that we have done. The blue ones are ones that are in progress. And the two red ones are ones that we have yet to begin working on. So as you can see in about what, 15 months, we've actually come a long, long way, uh, both in adapting an OER definition, setting up a statewide advisory council, which is basically one representative from each of our 29 public institutions. And that's kind of a big deal because not 28 of those 29 are undergraduate serving, but the 29th is our medical school who is also a part of this group. In addition, among the advisory council members, four of the advisory council members are student members. In fact, Nikki and Yorgo are two of those student members on that advisory council. Because as you can see, one of our, uh, one of the recommendations was to continue to encourage student advocacy. So we have absolutely done that both by having four students on the council, as well as coordinating very closely with the student advisory council in all of their endeavors and working very closely with them. The designation of my role as the statewide coordinator, uh, professional development we have been doing even before we began to create advisory council. We've continued to do uh, working on a statewide repository. And um, right now, one of the issues we are really focused on is the course management system or course marking um, to get that spread across the Commonwealth. Uh, this week, we put out a uh, press release to well to, to the into the social social media and media we're in traditional media world uh, as part of open education week and the big news was that since 2014 uh, we have saved students in Massachusetts uh, about seven million dollars in textbook costs by this effort of, of uh, pushing this movement towards open education and which is huge. I mean, that's just huge. However, I would add to that and then um, conclude with this, which is to say that although obviously saving students money is huge and is very important, and it's certainly one of the primary drivers of this work, it is not the only objective of this work. In addition to that, I think equally for us, we are as equally concerned, we equally concerned and value that OER provides faculty additional tools to for teaching and learning that they did not have before. And through open pedagogy, it provides them opportunities to make those tools more culturally responsive, reflecting on the student populations that we service and engaging students as co-creators of knowledge as well. So, the, the, so this OER work is not just again about cost savings, but it's a critical element of the equity agenda that we are driving in Massachusetts because open education enables students to get access to their learning materials on day one at a cost they can afford, preferably zero if they're using free OER resources. And as you, as you know, if students get the materials on day one, are able to get engaged in the course at the beginning of the course, they're more likely to, to get traction, persist, complete, and to graduate, which is what we're all about. And this is particularly true for a minoritized student population. So this is a huge, huge tool to help our equity agenda. So, um, so that's kind of what we've been doing in Massachusetts. We, I mean, there's other things going on, but that gives you a good highlight of where we are and our continued efforts to move forward in this work because it's just so critical to all that we value in Massachusetts. And with that, I think this goes to your go. Yes, your go. <laughs> we will turn this over to you. Thank you, Zil. Thank you, Bob, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, so I, I will start my part of the presentation with an anonymous quote that says, in all of my work in education, there has never been a more motivating or driving force than student voice. And as Bob mentioned, um, 
the, the OER initiative here in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would not be as advanced as it is now if it wasn't for the strong student voice and student advocacy we've been experiencing throughout the years. So the, the whole process started in April 2018 when the Student Advisory Council unanimously approved and presented a resolution regarding open educational resources to the Board of Higher Education. So the Student Advisory Council committed to support OER and work towards its statewide implementation. And that's what we've been doing since 2018. In January through March 2019, the Student Advisory Council appointed two student members to the newly created OER working group that Bob mentioned previously. SOC launched uh, the OER photo campaign where students would post uh, the amount they spend on a semester on books using the hashtag MAPoly or MA, uh, uh, hashtag MassOER. And it was a quite successful uh, photo campaign. We would tag our legislators, our school administrators, and let them know that this situation is urgent. We need help on this. On October 2019, the Student Advisory Council created the OER Statement of Support to identify students and faculty supporters of OER. We created a digital format of it, and we would distribute it to students digitally or through flyers with a QR code where they will scan the QR code, uh, fill the questions and express their support of the open educational resources. And we collected 1,932 uh, statements in total, which is an exemplary number. Next slide, please. Um, then we continued as, as we said, our efforts would not stop there. We, we worked, we are working, and we will always work towards implementing OER. So in, in March 2020, um, I was asked by the commissioner, uh, Carlos Santiago, to appoint uh, three members to the newly created OER Advisory Council, each of them representing a segment. Um, and since then, we've been working with that uh, statewide OER Advisory Council towards implementing um, those short and long-term measures we, we previously saw. From March 2019 until now, the Student Advisory Council uh, created the internal OER subcommittee, which Nikki is chairing, and we identified an OER student ambassador for each of the campuses. And this student ambassador would uh, collaborate with the school's administration, the faculty, student government association, or uh, fellow students of uh, his or her institution to further implement OER and advance its goals. And also the student would collaborate with uh, the assigned members of his or her institution to the statewide OER Advisory Council. Then from April 2018 till the present, the Student Advisory Council advocated on behalf of OER at the Freedom Advocacy Day and Community Colleges Advocacy Day uh, to the Massachusetts uh, State House and also the Board of Higher Education also when we were meeting with legislators. So um, our students, Student Advisory Council students or um, student uh, OER ambassadors, wherever they, they have a chance to speak about OER, its importance and uh, its implementation, we, we don't let the chance go away. We talk to the legislators, we let them know this is the work we're doing. This is the part where you need to weigh in and show the support if you're really interested and want to help your constituents, this is where you should go. And Bob knows, Sue knows that we've been very vocal about it and we will never stop being vocal about it. So go OER. And now let's turn it over to my vice chair, Nikki. Nikki, the floor is yours. Thanks, Yoriko. So what we've been doing for advocacy for, you know, for, for the past two weeks now is that we, so as Yorgo mentioned, we each have, um, we have an assigned OER student ambassador from our respective campuses. And we have a total of 25 student leaders overall from the Commonwealth of Mass, which is the most student leader participation we've ever had. And from there, um, every every couple of weeks, we've, we've gathered together to talk about OER, what you know, the, the benefits of it, the challenges of it. And also we came together to um, 
where we came together to have this project called 10 Days of OER, where um, where where we would share student statements, uh, whether it's written or video. And our goal of that was to increase student awareness and advocacy using social media. And from from our from our committee, we were able to have subcommittees under that with um, the OER um, in the, the OER Information Committee, the um, the, the OER video cinema, cinema photography committee and also the OER social media commi committee where um, Cody is the co-head of it and Andrew in um, <laughs> Andrew is also the um, the committee leader for for the OER information so we we've got OER information facts and student voices from all over Commonwealth and each day um, each day starting last Monday, we've shared either a video or or a student statement of why OER is essential and why it's important to us. And we've shared that on our Facebook um, Student Advisory Council page and our Instagram. And each day we've had like different stories um, trying to attract more attention to OER. And we've also tagged our legislators to get their attention as well on why OER is essential for, for us as students as part of like the equity agenda and everything. Um, Cody or Andrew, um, did you, do you guys want to jump in on about the project or anything? I think yeah, that's I'll... an excellent summary. Great, thank you. Um, so um, the, the next slide, please. All right, so now we are going to start. Thank you, Nikki and Yorgo for sharing that information. You guys have done some amazing work and I've become a top fan this week of the Student Advisory Council page. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing so you can um, see the students and Bob is going to moderate a discussion about different topics around OER. I'm going to stop my share. And I do ask that um, while the students are speaking, if you have any questions or comments, you can type them into the chat. We'll try to address the questions. Um, Liz and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll address them after, but um, we're happy to have you, um, you know, drop some questions into the chat. All right. Excellent. Ready to get going, Bob. All right. So, um, well, why don't I, I'll start off and I'll direct the question to a person because we have panel four people. So we wanna make sure everyone gets a chance to answer, ask, answer questions. But then of course, if somebody wants to add in, then certainly feel free to add in. Cause again, this is all about student voice. Um, so Nikki, since, is your role as um, uh, vice chair of OER for, for the Student Advisory Council. Um, certainly one of the ongoing challenges in this work of increasing the um, utilization of OER is getting faculty members to be willing to try it and, and check it out and see it as a, as in a viable and quality alternative to traditional uh, tools. What advice would you have, or what advice would you give a faculty member considering whether to shift to an OER course material? Um, thanks, th thank you, Mr. Awkward. Um, honestly, I, I would really suggest to faculty to try to adopt more OER into their course content or into their syllabi, just because like, I remember working with, um, with, with a classmate of mine last, last fall semester and we were we were taking a STEM course in physics and I remember asking him like hey you know how are you doing with your course and everything especially being student trustee for Bunker Hill like it's you know it's it's my job to make sure that students and their well-being and you know them doing well in their classes is essential making sure that they they're successful I remember the student telling me that you know I'm not doing well I'm not doing too well I still haven't gotten my book yet and mind you this is November and we were supposed to get our books in September and the reason why he didn't have the book because he didn't have enough money to buy access codes because he was taking care of his mom during that and he was paying all these different bills and 
the even though the professor and the student they were um they were accommodating him to make sure that he continues to pass to pass he was still unable to reach his potential and learn because of that roadblock of like like money to to get their course and everything so um a suggestion for faculty is to not only try to do some research and to adopt more OER materials into their syllabus, also having a conversation with their colleagues, with other different professors about OER, trying to increase the OER conversation, just because even though we as students, we can talk to our professors as much as we can, um, it's not as, um, it would be more impactful when professors and um, and faculty members discuss with each other um, the, the conversation about OER and just getting that momentum going and just increasing awareness no matter where we go. Um, also talking with your administration, um, finding like finding more resources about OER, just, just educating yourself as a faculty member while also listening to students. Um, yeah, that's so basically adopting more OER, but also increasing the OER conversations with their colleagues. Wow, excellent, excellent, Nikki. Um, any of your colleagues wanna add anything more to that? Especially from your personal perspective, because I think it's so impactful when people hear that. Okay. I've had experiences with professors who've said, I can't adopt OER because my course is too advanced. I don't have anything existing out there. And I think that's less a point towards OER isn't accessible and more a point towards communicate with faculty where their opportunities are to create or build their own open educational resources within their college because there are funding avenues that exist within the Higher Education Innovation Fund at the state level and grants all across the country. That That's, that's a great point you make, Andrew, about um, about the importance of faculty, both sharing their experiences with other faculty members, because uh, that always helps. Because you know, if I'm doing the same work as you're doing, and I say, "Here's what I've gone through," then that will help someone else. The second important point I think you raise in that is there are resources at your campus, your librarians, um, the instructional designers, um, and many librarians are have many of these institutions have librarians whose specific expertise is around OER. So that's another great resource that they could go to to help them find the material because that's certainly something I hear faculty say, well, there's not any material. There are disciplines where there really is, isn't much or any um, OER material. So that's something we have to look at in terms of uh, creation of new material. But oftentimes there's material, but people don't know where to go find it. So there are resources to go and help you both within your faculty, there are meta finders that will help people find resources. So those are great points you all brought up. In fact, Andrew, while I've got you, uh, let me ask you a, a, a kind of a connected question to this, which is really more from the student end. Um, course marking, you know, do you, you know what course marking is, right? Yes. What are your thoughts about course marking and should institutions do course marking, is that helpful to this work of increasing the use of OER on our campuses? Absolutely. I believe, especially from a student perspective, that OER course markings should be adopted because it gives students the agency to make their own economic decisions. They know which courses going in are going to be more affordable. They can plan their degrees, they can plan their semesters, they can plan around the bills that they expect. Mm. Um, and those course markings can appear as little notes underneath courses. Once you've, when you're scrolling through a digital catalog, they can appear as details of the course, just like the course time and dates um, when you select a particular course and they can just be markings that are accessible to the advisors when they're speaking with students as they register. So those aspects together create a, they create the option of seeing what's happening, knowing what you're getting into. But that's not the only aspect of course marking that's important. It's important at a faculty level because these faculty can see what are my colleagues doing 
Are OER courses getting higher enrollment? Are OER courses getting more engagement? What do the GPAs look like between different sections of courses without infringing on academic freedom, of course, but looking in terms of the numbers that we do get back, how can we improve the courses that are open? Are there improvements from courses that aren't open? And that can increase knowledge within the group of faculty. At an administrative level, you can map which courses are adopting OER and which departments to target to increase the implementation of OER. Mm -hmm. And if those institutions can work together on a federal and a state level, then you can see which courses have more OER generally. You can plan things like transfer programs that have little or no tuition, a cost beyond tuition in terms of fees, in terms of student materials, in terms of textbooks across a state or across a nation. And I think that's the broader goal with course marking. It can all, it can all come back to student information, but it goes all the way up. It's useful for everyone. Mm -hmm. Helping to inf inform the consumer. This is really what it's about, it's what's available and allow people to have choice and encourage more choice of open material, which will hopefully encourage more creation of open material, more both adoption, adapt, adaptation, and creation of open material. Exactly. Thank you, Andrew. Cody, let me swing to you, get you into this conversation on a different topic. Um, based on your experience with OER, what are your thoughts about the need for the use of printed materials and do you feel that the quality of OER, OER materials matches that of traditional materials in terms of your access to the material, ability to access it, to use it, to be able to read, gather the information from it? What's your experience with that? And how do you feel OER does or doesn't Im impact that? That is such a good question, mainly because everything nowadays is going digital. I mean, when's the last time you bought a physical CD at a store, right? Everything's going digital. And with that, uh, this comes into question about the need for physical books. And I have talked to a lot of students and heard from a lot of students this semester. And while it wasn't their main point, a, lot, a common thread between them was their love for physical books. Um, one of the benefits of Ebooks is, you know, that, you know, you have everything in one place that you can bring with you on your iPad, your computer, whatever. You don't have to lug around like a tote bag to make sure you have all those books with you. But that line about physicality makes a ton of sense. Um, it goes beyond just sentimental feelings too, about having and owning a book. It's, first of all, it's easy to keep track of. If you've gone through a online document, especially one that has like hundreds of pages. It is very easy to get disoriented or have trouble finding the notes or the information you need. A book, just open it up, everything's right there for you. Um, it also is beneficial for students who have trouble accessing internet. That happens to a lot of people where they can't either download the PDF file or they require an internet connection to access the information. So if a student even like wants to take a walk outside and enjoy nature, get out of the house for once, they can't. With some, uh, with some books. So that helps them that way. And another big issue is that physical books allow you to keep them. So if you have another class, most classes build upon each other. So having a physical book at house allows you to keep uh, reference material for your future classes. I know that a lot of math classes and science classes have keys and those are, those expire. So if you spend a $100, $200, whether that is a voucher money or out of your own pocket, what are you going to do? You're going to spend another $200 for a book you've already bought just to go back and reference material? That is really unreasonable for a lot of students. So I think when it comes to physicality of books, I think that if we're going to advocate for more education, having physical copies in addition to digital copies is important to reach in as many people as possible. And before I lose myself, <laughs> the second part of your question was the, the quality of the material. From personal experience, I, is, I have had a class with OER involved in it. Simple answer, yeah. It is unimaginably helpful and important. Uh, but I've also read online multiple professors who have been challenged on their implementation of OER in their classes. 
going on record to state that is not only uh, as adequate as, as bigger name as the higher price tag, but it also stacks up to that same way. Um, and it's also important because, you know, with the internet, there's mounds of information out there and it can feel, it, it, there's so much of it that it would take lifetimes to ship through it, to go through any particular subject. If you ever learn about chairs, it would take you literal lifetimes to learn everything about that. And having access to the information, especially open-wise, allows for, like I said before, a lot of more students to be in there. Um, and another benefit of having this access is that it allows teachers to modify their schedule and their content to fit what they're trying to teach. Mm. So it enhances uh, the education in that way too. Excellent. Thank you for such a comprehensive response, Cody. Appreciate that. And, and if, if you notice in the chat, uh, Sue noted, he also works at, in the bookstore and he holds the views that he has. I love it. <laughs> um, Let's do a little myth busting. Where's, where's Andrew? Let me swing back over to Andrew here. Um, and this is kind of a contrary question just to e explore this issue a little bit. What are some of the drawbacks or challenges of OER, OER you've experienced, if you've experienced them? And what would you say that would help to address those challenges? I think the main points that are touted as this is what's wrong with OER, this is why I can't implement it, is the quantity, the quality, and the aesthetic, the quantity being what OERs are available to me, the quality being, is this quality educationally? Is this quality in terms of organization? Is it easy and accessible for a professor to jump into? And what does it look like? Are these boring websites? I've seen more petty complaints on that end. I haven't experienced any personal downsides with OER, but I know students who have said, it feels like a mess. It feels like everything was just thrown in one place, especially with adopted OER from various different sources that it wasn't well organized. And the solution to those problems is also OER implementation and OER funding. Uh, there was a study released in 2019 by the American Education, I always forget the full name of the acronym, but the Ameri American Educational Resource Association, and they did a meta-analysis of 23 different studies on the efficacy of OER, and from tw the 22 studies studying educational outcomes, like personal understanding of the course material as self-reflected, understanding of the material in terms of grades, understanding of the material in terms of professorial perspective, there was no difference between traditional texts and open texts or OER courses versus traditional heavy courses. And in terms of withdrawal rates, that was 11 studies. It was found that among all the studies, withdrawal rates were lower for open educational resource courses. So the quality is not an issue here. In terms of quantity, there are dozens of websites online, some of the most notable being Lumen Learning, Creative Commons, and they, and OpenStax, they have searching tools for open ed, whether it's homework modules, whether it's entire texts or partial texts. And the open textbook library alone has over 800 textbooks within their library to search. The higher up in the niche you go, the more, the, the greater the need is to create OER. And that's something that can be done with additional funding from the federal level, from the state level, school by school. But in terms of your basic English course, your basic psychology course, your basic biology course, there are enough resources to make something that works. If it's aesthetically unpleasing, one of the main benefits of OER is you can retain, you can revise, you can remix, you can edit and shift in whatever way you'd like. So if something isn't working for you, if it's straying on your eyes, just edit it. That's part of your permissions as someone using open educational resources. Excellent, excellent. Um... And that discussion you had caused me to think about, um, as you're talking about textbooks, a lot of the publishers, of course, have moved into space where they, um, in large part, because OER is such a disruptor to the uh, oligopolistic nature of textbooks publishing in this country, uh, have gone to these, uh, you know, where you have the textbook and the interactives in a package 
you come into the course, the, it's already selected for the course. And it's certainly a lower course than the traditional textbook that might've been $200, this may be $100, $125, but it's certainly not free. It's certainly not low cost. I'm curious, Nikki, what um, drawbacks have you experienced with traditional textbooks or with these, um, these uh, situations where the publisher does an access code for you to get access to the material? And uh, how has that worked for you or not? Um, honestly, um, the access codes are the main reason why like the, the course content when, when students get their, their materials are so expensive. So like with my experience, like access codes will be like $200. But then mm. if I want to have an additional text, like physical copy of the textbook, it would just be like an extra 20 or $30 on top of that. But if I just buy the book alone without access codes, it's just 20 or $30. Like it, it, it would just be like $40 by itself. So that access code is the prime reason why students like, professors and students needed to, you know, in order to learn and, um, and, and be in a, compre a comprehensive work environment to be able to learn the, the course. I feel that like students taking, you know, course requiring access code is like pretty prohibitive, um, especially for low income students, because mm -hmm. you have to, um, there's just a paywall, like you have like that publishing companies do is that like you have to fork over the money um, for the access code if you don't have that money, you would fail. So sometimes, you know, the free trials that they offer, like Wally Plus or Pearson, they offer like their two week, their free two week trial, they don't cover for a semester. Um, I've had students where like they try to complete their whole entire coursework within that two, that free two week trial just to pass their course. And it's just not equitable. Like how can students continue to learn and be, be part and be engaging with their classmates and have like you know have full long effective discussions with their professors if they're in that time crunch like it's just it's just not equitable so mm -hmm. like i feel like with oer you know it's you know it's either low cost or free but it'll, it would level the playing field for disadvantaged students because mm -hmm. like knowledge is power mm -hmm. and an equitable bar inequitable barrier such as like publishing industries holding those educational materials captive like they lock students away from accessing it and like another problem with like access codes is that um after like at, like after you're done with the semester you can't go back to the book mm -hmm. or you can't go back to the video to mm -hmm. you know to um to rewatch or to relearn what it, whatever it is that you're trying to miss so that's that's the challenge with access codes mm -hmm. excellent nikki thank you yorgo i'm coming to you because I, I got something for you on that study you talked about andrew by the way i think that's a north north dakota state um uh, did that study you're talking about the meta study looking at um, OER materials versus traditional materials. And the study basically debunked the, one of the big myths that OER materials, that students, people, students prefer OER materials because they're easier, they're not as good. And that study showed that the, the, in terms of quality, the materials were comparable and students, the retention in the classes that use the OER materials were higher than the classes that did traditional materials. So that's a big study. You want me to look that up, the North Dakota State study. Um, given, um, given the time in which we live, the pandemic in which we're living, um, I'm curious, how has COVID-19, this is for you, Yorgo, how has COVID-19 impacted student learning in terms of OER? As you mentioned, Bob, this this is uh, an unprecedented time we're living in, and uh, COVID disrupted every aspect of our life. And of course, it would reach to uh, the student learning and uh, the educational system. So, especially community colleges um, around the nation have invested in the development and implementation of free open educational resources as a means of relieving inequitable uh, student financial burdens and also removing barriers to competition and access that surface primarily due to COVID. 
uh, of course, these issues um, existed uh, way before COVID surfaced, but uh, with COVID, everything got worse. Uh, we, we see students uh, struggling um, to pay their tuition, pay their housing, pay for their food. So that's where uh, OER comes as a shining sun <laughs> to, to help on, on the situation, on this dark situation we're living in. And uh, with the start of the pandemic, the, the whole US education system shifted its modality from in-person to remote, finding OER to be extremely useful given its digital format. So mm -hmm. um, previously we, uh, we looked and researched uh, how good the digital format is versus the, the physical format. But now uh, given COVID and the, the situation we're living in, I think that the its digital modality um, OER was was really successful, and I think it's it's the most equitable choice we can have right now, and the most affordable, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yorgo. In fact, that kind of opens up a good question. I'll put this out to any of the students who want to jump in on it, uh, which is beyond cost savings which is of course the big thing we always lead with in OER because it's, it's, it's something that's tangible. I mean, certainly when we're talking to lead, uh, educational leaders, the legislators, that's a big impact for them and, 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 and that's good. And, and if that moves them to action, that's great. But beyond cost savings, how does OER create racial and ethnic equity in this era? Certainly in Massachusetts, we're, you know, in the equity agenda, we're very focused on trying to address issues of racial justice and, and, equ and equity for our students. And as I mentioned in, my, in the opening, that we see OER as an important uh, tool to help address that. As from a student perspective, how do you, how do you see OER um, helping to address the issues of racial eth and ethnic equity? Oh, wanna... let me let me add something on that mm. as most of the people in this call know massachusetts is a is a pioneer of uh, equity we we're uh, advancing our equity agenda as uh, as a department of higher ed and also as a, as a commonwealth so um Talking about the, the cost of test books, especially as a proportion of income for disproportionately impact student groups, the, the, this is enormous. And also uh, on the equity side, Massachusetts um, public higher education system serves uh, the biggest community of uh, the Latinx population, of black and brown students, of uh, uh, other students of underrepresented populations. So OER, uh, as I said, impacts uh, the, the uh, attending cost side of it, but also it gives the students a boost to continue their education and also improves the rates of, of completion. Excellent. Did you, did you want to pick up on that, Nikki? No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just calling and agreeing that everything's so beautifully. <laughs> um, anyone else want to talk about uh, OER in terms of its addressing issues of equities for st students with disabilities, for example, or uh, for, for our LGBTQ community? And Andrew, did you have some thoughts? Absolutely, on I can speak on those points. As we all know, LGBTQ people are more vulnerable to homelessness than the general population. Most estimates land between one out of every three homeless youth and one out of every, one out of every five homeless youth. And that's usually defined as the ages between 15 and 25. Uh, uh, a third to a fifth of that entire population identifies as LGBTQ+, and those are the people that need public education, especially at the community college level, where they're just trying to get a simple two-year degree and lift themselves out of poverty. It's essential for those folks, and it's still legal in the United States to pay people with disabilities less than the federal minimum wage, which is still, as we speak, $7.25 an hour. That's not enough to pay for a lot of different kinds of educational materials, especially extensive textbooks, especially STEM textbooks. And those students have those cost saving issues. But in addition to that, it can be frustrating and isolating to be staring at a textbook and the faces don't look like you. The students and the individuals on those pages aren't experiencing what you're experiencing. It's a very white centric, a very heterocentric, a very cis centric, a very aimless 
view because those are the authors that are able to make their way up because they were personally educated. So it sort of perpetuates a system in pedagogy that's really whitewashed, that's really cleansed in, in sort of a angelic white Christian view. And it doesn't really represent all religions. It doesn't really represent all walks of life. So being able to see yourself on that page is crucial. And in addition, there is a lot of accessibility issues that can come up with traditional texts, texts that are really small, access codes where you have to log in again and again, people with memory issues can have trouble with forgetting passwords and open educational resources are usually, you just click the thing and you get in. Because you are able to retain it, you can print it, you can redistribute it to other people and you can print it in a size of font and a type of font that's more readable to you. You can translate it into a text-to-speech text software for those who are visually impaired for those who are auditorily impaired and have videos, those often have captions or they are allowed to have captions because they're open. You can edit them, you can shift them in any way that you like. So it levels the playing field for those students. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. And given, given the um, student voice here, and one of the strong messages I think has come through here is about the role of student advocacy because as I said, students are not only the major beneficiaries of this, oh yeah, certainly one of the beneficiaries, I think the major beneficiary, but also they have been the progenitor pushing this. Um, Yorgo, let me toss this question to you. I think this is a good one for you. Um, and particularly for our audience, I think this may be something useful for them to hear about, because some of the people I think are on here to say, well, not only what is the issue for students, but how can we expand this work on our campus? So as a student advocating for, uh, for OER on your campus, what strategies have you used to reach students, faculty, faculty and administrators, especially during this uh, pandemic? Uh, what has or hasn't worked and why? So but before the COVID era, that's how I'm referring to it. <laughs> when classes were conducted in person, I used to reach out to students um, um, and faculty and administrators. The whole process was much easier, of course. So I would usually approach students on campus in the student center or the cafeteria with a flyer and a QR code that contained information about OER. I would explain what OER is and what, uh, what its benefits are. And I would usually collect students' contact information, an email or a phone number, so I could follow up with them, uh, ask their, uh, answer their questions or provide them with additional information on how they could support OER on the campus and, and beyond. During the COVID era, um, while we'll, uh, we've been all using Zoom to conduct our classes and all that, I would usually ask for permission or an instructor to join the Zoom for let's say five to 10 minutes and explain to their students what the OER is, uh, what we're doing, why is it important for us? Why do we need to push it forward? And also I would um, reach out to the school newsletter, to the newspaper, uh, provide this information out there for students uh, so they can see it with bright colors and understand how important it is for us. Because even most of us uh, want to support it, they don't know what it is. And it's way extremely harder to support something that you don't understand. So that's what we're trying to do, make it easier for them. Mm -hmm. um, regarding faculty, um, what I've used personally is reaching out to my professors that I had either taken classes with in the past or were taking classes uh, at, the, at, the, at the very time. So reaching out to faculty means you need to be very prepared for their questions because they're of course uh, a high caliber population. And you know, professors are always doubting. <laughs> they want to question whatever you're saying. So you need to be really prepared and uh, provide them with a thorough um, summary of whatever you're going to, to present to them. Um, a strategy I followed was reaching out to the faculty senate at Consigament Community College, reaching out to the learning council, which is responsible for developing the curriculum for the year, and also the library department and uh, members of the OER advisory council on, on the Consigament Community College campus. And that seemed to be very fruitful when I tell them 
I'm the chair of SAC reaching out to you. That's that kind of makes them happy. <laughs> so uh, we've been trying to, let's say, reach out to faculty members and librarians on different fronts so we can provide them with all the information needed so they can make a, a really educated um, decision. Hmm. Thank you. That's very comprehensive. Um, so, uh, I, I see we about five minutes of, and I know there's some closing material we need to do for triple C OER. So mm -hmm. I probably should kick back to you because we, you know, I can, this is great. I can sit here and talk with these students for, <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a follow up panel. So I just <laughs> typed into the chat. If you have any questions, you could please um, type them into the chat. Um, and we will try to answer them for you. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I wanna thank um, the students um, who did an amazing job. And I feel so inspired and lucky to work with such a great group of students in Massachusetts. And I'm so excited that you guys have taken OER to this level. Um, so let's go ahead. And we have some, oh, did I skip a slide? No, okay. Um, so CCCOER has webinars that are free. And if you go on their website, you can sign up for them. Um, so the spring webinars are listed here. We have the rest of Open Education Week, which I'll talk about um, April 14th. We're gonna talk about K through 12 and community colleges collaboration on OER. Um, finding professional development resources for adoption and creation, which may be in, very interesting to you. We had a lot of great webinars um, in the fall that were related to equity and um, racial you know, pedagogy and things like that. So, and they're all recorded and posted on our website. Um, and for the rest of, Open Ed Week, we're already at Wednesday. Um, tomorrow, we have an asynchronous event on open pedagogy and equity. And then on Friday, um, Global and CCC OER Leadership. So you can check out more, um, you know, on the, like I said, on the CCC OER website or on the Open Ed Week website. And stay in the loop. Um, we list all of the open conferences on um, under get involved on our website. And I guess while I'm here, I'm going to put a little plug in for the Northeast OER Summit. <laughs> um, it is May 24 through 26 and the registration is gone live today and the call for proposals, the keynote speaker will be announced later today. So I just dropped the registration link into the website. And the best part about it is it's free this year. So a lot of these virtual conferences are free. So go ahead and register. I'd love to have um, more students attend this year and really open it up to you know the entire country and beyond. <laughs> so um, the community email list is open. You don't have to be a member of CCC OER to join the community email list. And it's probably the most vibrant and active listserv that I've ever been involved in. And also we have um, blog posts and student impact stories on our website. So if you are ever interested in submitting a blog or a story, um, you can go ahead and check that out. All right. And let's see, I think that takes us right to 12.59 p.m. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again to the students. And I see a lot of positive comments in the chat. So feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, the recording and the slides will be posted on the CCCOER website later this afternoon. <laughs>